Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors, America's only daily outdoor TV show. Your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax. It's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors. I'm Winston Chester. Glad to hear this Wednesday morning. Got a big show lined up. But first, I always want to take a look at the weather. Uh, this cool, uh, cool air coming in at night. I, I know that makes you feel a lot better. It makes me feel better. Uh, you start thinking about these fall cool snaps coming in, and uh, we, the old dove hunters used to say, when, in front of a cold snap, those doves would be pushed down. Also, the duck hunter said the same thing about the birds being pushed down ahead of those fronts, and that is true. I can guarantee you it's true because we've, I've seen it too much in my lifetime. I haven't read the biologists what they say about it, but the old timers uh, convinced me of it years ago. So things do move around. Uh, so let's take a look at high today is 78, low 62, and our river readings, I don't have them today, I promise I'll get them tomorrow. Tide chart brought to us by Kent Forest Lawn. We're looking today is September 30th, and we're looking at a high tide at 9.34 this morning, a low of 506, and another high at 11.26. So when you see three tides and all, something like that, you know that's pretty close to what we call neap tides, not much tidal flow. It's going to be aided by the wind uh, west-northwest at 13. Uh, the, the, uh, the tides, you know, we had a, full, had a full moon coming tonight, and a lot of times the tide just was sort of not much, and then it's real strong right after the full moon. So I'm looking on the tide chart. We've got, we got some good tides coming up, but anyway, t today is, is neap tides. All right? All right, let's take a break, and we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Let's take a quick look at a sort of midweek report because this cool air gets me thinking about one thing we haven't talked a lot about on the Friday fishing reports last two weeks because I, I looked at my notes. We haven't talked about the flounder. The flounder are getting ready to move now, so you know, be aware of that. The flounder and the mullet. Uh, October, the row is right, and I want to see some of y'all out there throwing a net, and I, I promise you I'm going to get that instructional video up pretty soon on, on throwing the net. I, I just uh, haven't, haven't gotten to it yet. So anyway, midweek, uh, start checking out the flounder. They're going to start gathering up now and getting ready to go out to pass. And same way down in uh, Apalachicola Bay and same way over in Sock to Hatchet Bay. They're going to start uh, gathering up. So that's a little midweek report. I want you to just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, a quick, uh, we got, listen, we've got two fish fries coming up. I love to go to fish fries. Uh, I feel like they're good and safe, especially outdoors. They're all outdoors. They're always good fellowship and all. And I'm tickled that they're starting them back. Uh, uh, the Bent Rod Fishing Club in the Funiac Springs, my buddies up there, and lady friends, they're putting one on on October the 14th. And I'm looking forward to going up there and seeing everybody. That's on a Wednesday. So we're going to try to get up there. And then on October the 24th, check this out. All the folks down to Howard Creek, Patricia Fowler, Miss Patricia Fowler, attention all fishermen and fisherwomen plan to participate in the Shad Eye Shriner Director Staff annual brim fishing tournament and fish fry on 24th and mason and shriners will be available to sponsor anyone now just you know uh okay it's going to be 30 dollars boat to enter you kick off at 7 a.m way in at three fish plates here's a big deal you don't have to fish it now but you can go down there and get a fish plate are you talking about some good food now they're cooking right there on the spot they're going to start at two o'clock at the upper landing and they're going to start uh, fixing it then. And you know, uh, we talked about this before. What, what a the Shriners, what a wonderful job they do in, in helping people. And, and you know the reputation of Shriners and an active group down there. And all this money goes toward they're going to end up in helping young people and, and folks that are, that need help. So the, this uh, fish fry, I definitely plan on being there. If the creek don't rise, and good Lord's willing, I will be there. I, I don't want to fish it. I want some other people to win. Maybe Jimmy Lovett, some of those guys who catch a few brim. But we, we want to go to it. And anytime you have a fundraiser like this, outdoor related, let us know. We'll let the folks know. And folks, I'm telling you, it's worth the drive. To, if you just live in the area, just drive down there, enjoy the fellowship, and get some good fish and all. I wanted to mention, I was looking over this the other day. We're talking about books and all a lot. A lot of times I talk about my book. I've, I've talked about this book before, The Last Voyage of the Tarpon. What made me think about this, we get these September storms coming in, and I, I think about, you know, they're really strong September storms, and, you know, you saw with Sally and then others and all of this. The tarpon, 
a lot of the folks don't don't uh, know. I'm going to read you the back cover because I want you to be aware of it. Uh, a good, good close friend of mine wrote this book, uh, the late Captain Richard Holly, and he's in my book. And I was with him on a daily basis as he was writing the book. He he asked me for some <clears throat> advice and different things because I'd already done my book, and he came out with his. and And Richard worked hard on this book. Spent a lot of time in Mobile, uh, researching information over there. So it's, it's good stuff. But uh, the tarpon, the big deal on a tarpon, it, it ran from 19, okay, 1903 to 1937. It ran for 34 years now. Keep in mind, during that time, we didn't have a lot of highways. We had a couple of basic ones, but the commerce and the trade and the passengers, they went, they would go from Apalachicola all the way to Mobile. That was the main route. They stopped in Carabell, Apalachicola, Panama City, Pensacola, Mobile. That was the route. And Captain Barrow, he was a legendary figure. He was, he was there every day running it. And it, he was, uh, but the weather, it, when it, the weather hit him really strong. It had 31 people on board and only 11, 11 or 12 survived. 19 of them drowned. What happened, they, they got overtaken by, he, he thought he could make it into Panama City. And you know, they didn't have the radar back then. And uh, the, the, the guys, and the ladies, a couple ladies on board, the cooks and all, it was a big, big thing. In fact, uh, right at the end of where Highway 79 comes out into the beach area, it happened sort of in that area there. And I was reading last night how, they, how the guy, the Coast Guard came in looking for them, and they actually found a lot of the survivors that sort of washed in towards, they sort of floated in towards Choctahatchee Bay, and they picked them up because it wasn't that far, and they went, the waves kept, kept washing them. And, but this gives a the detailed account from the, from the interviews of the people that survived it and all. And if this book, Richard's uh, daughter, April Holly Riley, may have some down at the, she and her husband own the corner tire store down on Harrison Avenue, and check with April and, and try to get this book. If you, if you like if maritime history, if you're into that kind of stuff. And, all, and I want to bring different things up, but one of, one of the cool things, I remember I, I showed this, these two old wooden models. The, these were hand carved by someone in St. Andrew. One of my students brought these to me. Uh, that's the old net boat. But this is a replica of the tarpon. And it was found in an attic down in St. Andrews and when the guy was uh, tearing down an old house. And I don't know much about the history. We know it was hand carved and painted and somebody just, just made a toy for a kid or just wanted something. But anyway, the, the tarpon is, is a part of our rich maritime history here and all kind of details. And another side note on it, uh, we talked about with Ronnie Groom on before, how they actually, now it sank in 33, they, nobody really looked for it, for the boat. And then uh, in the 50s, late 50s, Ronnie Groom and all of them were getting in a diving. Ronnie was a leader. And Ronnie and a couple of guys on a boat and put Ronnie's brother behind the boat. They knew about what area, and he was holding on to rope with a mask on, and it pulled them back and forth in the area for hours until he found it. And they found it by finding the amberjack that had been on it. And they found, they were the first ones to actually dive. So I, I just think that's, a, that's some really cool stuff. So I just wanted to show that and share it with you. And it was, a, when they were searching for those survivors, though, it was interesting reading those uh, uh, court report. They, they did a big hearing on it. And that's where a lot of the information comes from. Okay, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Hey, all your viewers are special to me, and a lot of y'all who give me a lot of feedback, and I, I have a good friend of mine, Greg Taylor, who gives me a lot of feedback, and I, I really enjoy reading his emails, and he, he goes into such details about what's going on, and he's, he's a good man, a good outdoors man. I'm gonna show you a picture of Greg. He's gonna be embarrassed now, but here's a, here on his email. This is Greg Taylor. He's one of the founders that counts real estate. I've tried to get him to come on the show, try to get him to advertise and all that, but Greg, <laughs> I, I get a kick out of He sent me this. I'm gonna read it to you because he, this is him growing up around the beach area. He's around my age, and, and uh, he, he, lived, he lived on the lake. At, I, I want you to sort of flash back. And he lived on the lake uh, at Lakeside. I would ride my bike from the Y to the county pier at daylight. This is a kid now. I fished till, up the top of the page, I fished till the bus stopped to pick me up. The bus driver, Sarah Hogg, would let me stow my rods and tackle box on the bus and then will drop me back off at the pier in the afternoons. 
After fishing, I was riding my bike home. Now, is that not a great way to spend a day? I kept a cooler with, a, with my name on it tied at the foot of the pier. Can you imagine doing that now? That would last, what, 30 minutes? My father would stop in the morning on the way to open up the bank. He worked at Beach State Bank, the only bank on the beach at Woodlawn. If I had any fish, he would transfer them into a cooler he kept in his car. I only had fish uh, stolen out of the cooler once. Uh, I would also, number two, I would catch a bucket of live alewives at the pier and take them home and bass fish with them in Loyal Water Lake. Flashy silver alewives, they were deadly and bass couldn't resist them. Number three, I would strap big ling or kings across my bike basket and ride home from the county pier to Lakeside. Is that not cool stuff? Number four, I'd shoot ducks on Loyal Water Lake behind my house at daylight before anyone caught up. And number five, I would strategically place four or five concrete blocks along the shoreline in waist deep water along the shore of West Bay, around Holiday Isle the golf course, sitting on the blocks with a single branch stuck in, in it with my mallard decoys and kill my limit of 10 bluebills and an occasional pintail of matter, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I just wanted to share uh, what Greg and I uh, he emails a lot, but that was growing up in the area in the, in the 60s and all, and what you could do. And I, that was just was refreshing to me to read that, and I wanted to share that with you because so many people live there now. You can't do any of that stuff. You can't shoot ducks on low water. You can't leave your ice chest out there. You can't put your rod and reels on a school bus and ride to school, but those, in those days you could. So I hope you enjoyed that. Now, uh, let's move on up. The other day uh, I had the video from from Haney, I didn't get it, get it all in. I showed the auto tech. I have about four minutes left uh, showing the, uh, we went to other, Alex and I went to other part of the school and showed you some other things. They're really interesting stuff. And think about it, these classes opening up in October. That's why I want to show them now and maybe we'll help some people out. So we got a little four minute video uh, wrapping up our visit to Haney Tech. So Jeff, let's go ahead and roll that. Hey Alex, uh, tell us where we are now. We've walked across campus and uh, so we are in the uh, medical administrative specialist and the office administrative specialist. And these are our two amazing instructors. Uh, this is Debbie Farrell. And if you want to share a few words about your program, and then when you finish, we will have Heather Marshall talk briefly about her programs because both of these programs currently have openings. Okay, tell us about your program. All right, well we have office admin and medical admin and uh, we do a terrific job preparing uh, women and men for the future in business. Uh, we get them uh, certified in Microsoft Office Specialist, which includes Excel, PowerPoint and Word. They learn uh, procedures, uh, office procedures, soft skills in today's world about attendance and being there. And then we prepare them towards the end and interviewing uh, job readiness. Um, our big thing right now is there's such a demand in medical admin here in our city in Bay County and so we've added a lot of things to our course and our program with medical admin. Uh, we just recently added and uh, Ms. Marshall can let you know about um, electronic health records. It's a big thing in the world today. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you get to the medical, you're learning coding, transcription, you're also learning electronic health records and scheduling patients and taking insurance. So they are really prepared to go into a medical office and be a great employee by the time that they leave here. And this is special because you have, uh, you came from this program? or I did. I actually <laughs> was a student in this program at one point and then I became the para here and then eventually they decided that I was qualified enough <laughs> <laughs> to become the instructor here. It's it's a great full circle for me. It feels mm -hmm. very satisfying to be here and if anybody can help these students, we can because I've been there and I've been in the sea mm -hmm. and I know exactly how the program works. The other, thing, the other thing that we do that's awesome is we have a, a in externships from uh, all over here in the community in the medical offices and the students actually uh, participate in work-based study at the medical offices for five weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's a terrific experience for the students. It's a great opportunity for them to be out in the workforce mm -hmm. and in the local community and for the local community and businesses to know how our Haney students are as employees. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful. That's a great idea. And and one of my, you got plenty of room in here. I mean, you got some great 
Uh, and one of my favorite things about this room is, is your floor. I <laughs> love it, seriously. <laughs> but that, this shows people we're still not quite back to where we were. That's right. <laughs> so, right. And we still work hard just to try to get. I know. Y'all just kept on <laughs> keeping on. Well, thank y'all so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for stopping by. Okay, Alex, you want to add a couple things to this? So, just a little uh, fine. Um, specs about the program it can be completed in around nine or ten months uh, if you start in august it can usually be completed in a full school year but with the COVID scheduling the students are coming either uh, from 7 30 until 2 30 on monday and tuesday or wednesday and thursday and then they split half a day on friday so even though it's a full-time schedule they're doing hybrid learning so they will actually flex those uh, two and a half days where they can work remotely so for people that have to work a full-time job and need that flexibility uh, it, it, it is a doable option so they can call 850-767-5500 and we can talk to them about the options help them with the registration process again just like our other programs we have financial aid and scholarships for those who qualify um, and it, it's just a great time to re retrain if you're looking for an opportunity uh, we'd be glad to talk to you about those options all right great Alex. thank you so much this is really good stuff glad to have you out here Okay, welcome back. Let's look at our fishing game time today on a one time brought to us by Blue Water Outriggers down in Port St. Joe. We're looking at 10.33 to um, 10.53 to 12.53. I've got a couple of pictures I want to show you. One, uh, don't forget, I, mean, I showed this the other day, first annual uh, Smoker King of the Pier, the Act Tournament. I mentioned this Monday. And go ahead and sign up for it because it runs uh, from October 1st through 31st. Go ahead and be aware of that and, and sign up. There's a phone number on the bottom there. And like I said, Monday, it's good to have these these back here in, into the uh, into our situation where we have them. I got this email too. Uh, ben Steele sent this to me. This is funny. Ben Steele said, uh, Winston Chester thought you might want to put this on the show. And it's coming. Uh, this is when we had all that rain over there the other day. This is flounder fishing has improved in, <laughs> in St. Augustine, folks. This is a flounder on the highway. I told, I told Ben, I think, what, I forgot, I, I commented on it. I said, we need to send this to FWC because they're telling us we don't have any flounder. <laughs> but uh, that, that's cool right there. And, you know, it looks like he's in the walkway, so he's crossing at, crossing at a good point. So thanks, Ben Steele. Ben Steele, one of our loyal viewers. And I had a, this is a, I want to share this. Uh, this is one of from one of my students I actually sent it sent it to uh, advice from a tree. She's one of my former students, and, uh, and she was out. Uh, that's out in Arkansas where she is walking through the woods, and uh, and she talked about this, and uh, she just loved walking in the woods. She and her husband and the kid. Uh, advice from a tree: Stand tall, remember your roots, drink plenty of water, embrace your natural beauty. Think long term and enjoy the view. And I thought that was so appropriate, especially to give that to a young person and let them let them look at it. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to talk about that. Also, the other day I ran across some some information. Uh, and I got I sort of got I chuckled at it because you know we almost can predict this, and we're talking about the wild hogs, and we talk about them. Uh, on occasion, a, a pretty re a pretty regular talking about a wild hog population and how how they really get into the farmers up in here, the panhandle especially, how they get into the farmers fields and, and they're hard to control. And, and I ran across this and it was an article. Actually, uh, let me see. This was, this was actually on a, on, a, somewhere on a Fox News station, rising populations of wild hogs are worrying the experts. Many deemed it uh, they have some super pigs. And so I found some research and here, of course, here is just a picture of them. The photo shows feral hogs eating corn at a deer feeder. This is out in Texas, Associated Press and Texas A&M Research. So that's some strong people in Texas A&M and Auburn and Florida and those outdoor-oriented uh, kind of a programs they have when they're talking about it. And I, I, I was reading some notes. I took some notes on them. The U.S. Department of Agriculture said we have 9 million hogs in America. And they, they estimated from the farmers that's $2.5 billion worth of damage. Remember, I was telling you all this. I didn't realize it was that extensive across America, that kind of damage from wild hogs. And uh, so they say it's a, a feral time bomb 
getting ready to go off. And somebody said, well, it could be a feral swine bomb. I thought that was cute. They're in, they used to be in 17 states. Now they're in 39 states. So they're spread. But here's what's worrying people. It's sort of like, with, you know, they'll breed with domestic hogs and then they'll crossbreed. And you know when that kind of stuff happens, you start getting hybrids. And it, they actually sometimes it's like, like, you know, mixture. And when you get two dogs, two different breeds and all, you get a different mixture. And a lot of times the hybrid is stronger th as far as resisting th uh, the elements and all. And they're saying, the experts are saying, uh, with this crossbreed, that they're, they're testing that what they think are two things. They have a very a, a stronger sense of smell, number one, and number two, they're thinking they're more intelligent in, in getting away from uh, traps and all. Because you know how easy it is to trap. In the old days, you just, you just trap them and put some corn in there to go right in there. They're saying these new wild hogs or this hybrid of wild hogs are getting a lot harder to be trapped because they're more intelligent and they have a stronger sense of smell. So if a man has been around there for a while, you know, they can smell them. This is something, we, you know, I, I'm going to uh, look more into this. Uh, we, we encourage you, uh, all of you, on a regular basis to let's, let's go out at night and shoot these hogs. It's all legal. It's a fun kind of thing to do. You have this, you know, night vision optics, and it's a fun thing to do. And again, it's helping the farmers in the area. And you know, we've talked about it before, and we've actually been on some hog hunts, and you know, with uh, Walter and, and Whitney before, and there were different people uh, with our alpha buddies up there. And it, we we thought we were doing you know some kind of control, but obviously with nine million nine million uh, out there, we haven't been. So uh, I, I was thinking, if if the armadillos and the wild hogs, if one of them would be dominant. But a wild hog will not mess with armadillo, and armadillo will not mess with a wild hog. So, but uh, anyway, I just want to bring that up. You saw, you saw the picture there. But uh, we, we, uh, there, I've seen it, and you know, we see it. They're, they're coming up out of swamps. They spread out all over the place. All the hunters are having trouble with them. You know, eating the corn, and and it's, it's going to be. And like I say, it's a it's a feral swine bomb. The, the experts think it's going to happen. Run out of time. Uh, y'all give me some feedback on that, what y'all think the best, best way to control them. Y'all have a great day. Do something good today for your fellow man. Enjoy the outdoors, and God bless. Thanks for watching America's only daily outdoor TV show, Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester, featuring hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.